Hey now, welcome to the City Off Campus podcast with your two favorite hosts, Sammy Sommerfeld and Jack McFarland. Well, I'm chilling on campus. Jack's chilling off campus on Chicago area. But before we dive into this sports-filled pod that me and Jack have a lot to discuss on this podcast, but and we are very excited to dive into all of our sports topics. But first, let me tell you guys about a new and exciting brand launching right here in Iowa. It's called Apex. Apex is a performance apparel brand launching on July 15th. So coming up very soon to today's July 9th. Apex is founded and operated by Austin Martin, who's a former Division I baseball player at the University of Iowa. Go give them a follow at Apex brand underscore. I'll say it again, at Apex brand underscore. A-P-E or A-P-E-X brand underscore, just to be clear. And be on the lookout for updates pre-launch and on and on launch day on July 15th. Now, Jack, going into the sports. Let's well, I can into- guarantee one thing before we even hop into it. I just saw on ESPN2 the other day the national script spelling bee, and I can tell that you wouldn't have won it with the way you were just spelling Apex. I know. It was, it was bad. You know what, Jack? I was so excited to talk about last night's game at the NBA Finals that Apex I, – I skipped over a little bit. My bad. But guess what? We're going to be talking a lot about Apex the next couple of weeks. So I think I'm going to get better along the way. 100%. But yeah, last night's game two of the NBA finals. I mean, Suns and four, we're a Suns podcast. We have been ever since last episode. And yeah. I mean, the Suns keep rolling on. I don't, I, I don't really have any worries about this team going forward. There's seriously no problems with them. They're a championship team. Chris Paul, this is his legacy year. Like this is his year. So I don't think anything's stopping them. Can I tell you something? When Giannis puts up 42 points, 12 rebounds, and three blocks, yeah. and they still lose by 10, yeah, that just shows how the Suns team is just right until the end. Now, the thing I am worried about with the Suns is Torrey Craig got hurt. Then also, too, who, um, oh, who got hurt right before that? Um it was oh last game um Dario got hurt and he's out for the year. Oh yeah, yeah it's okay so if Dario gets hurt, they have Frank Kaminsky on the bench. Well, they have, really, yeah, I mean, really I mean big, he tough, play, big tough I mean he guy. played one minute last night, but that's a hard sixty seconds. I don't think I could have done it. Oh dude, the screens he set are just gorgeous. If he even set one, yeah. Who knows oh, if he, he even does. Had time. Oh, he set some. He set some. But I'm just a little worried here about one thing that the Suns have had is depth. And obviously, guys like Moore, Galloway, like Javon Carter, like there are guys that didn't play who could obviously pick up a ball and play a little bit if they need some guys to rest. But Karen what, Johnson, what an amazing statement, right? That they pick up a ball and play. Yeah, no shit, it's true. Sam. <laughs> it's well, that's all they do. Is they, I'm not saying they'd score. I'm just saying they pick up the ball, play for about five minutes, and they throw CP3 or Booker or whoever they need in. But Cameron Payne played 10 minutes, but, you know, he's a nice little guy who just kind of comes in, you know, makes one or two plays in the game. He lets CP3 rest. I mean, CP3 is a 36-year-old guy playing 41 minutes in this game. And he put he was 10 for 20 from the field. He put up three threes, and he put up 23 points and eight assists. I mean, what more can you ask for as CP3 after the last game he had where he put up over 30? And then you got D book who went on a tear. This was his welcome to the NBA finals moment. Like D books, a superstar in my eyes. Now. He oh, yeah. is after a night like this, he put up seven threes. He made 12 baskets, like putting up 31 points. Like oof, this was a game, but there was a, a dude. Some of his shots from three were just like, absolutely. He was like just a sharpshooter this game, like just, make them they weren't like rolling off the rim didn't have a bad bounce into the basket they were just lasers just falling right into the hoop it was beautiful deandre ayton put up 10 points this game so a little bit less of a night than what he had the previous game but he had 11 rebounds which i mean when you're going up against Giannis and the pain i mean you get an 11 rebounds right there and then jay crowder getting 10 like that's huge but i'm just the thing that i'm going to go back to though is the depth is just what worries me we're like, if there's a game where some of the guys in the starting five are just a little gassed and they need somebody to, you know, take over for them a little bit. I don't know. It's just, I'm worried the bench is running a little thin. That's yeah, the thing yeah, I'm worried about. Because if you look at this Bucks team, like they got guys who can, I mean, 
Justin Jackson isn't a great player, but like Justin Jackson could come off the bench if you absolutely needed him to. I mean, Bryn Forbes only played six minutes last night for the Bucks. Bobby Porter's played five. Like those guys barely played. They're ready to go the next game if they need to play. You know what I mean? Yeah, so just... uh, there's, I mean, you, one thing I look at like minutes right here, and I'm not the type of guy to like look at minutes and say this is a really big thing, but like the Suns, they're starting five. Jay Crowder played 30, 37, Bridges 38, 8 and 42, Paul 41, Booker 44. You go to their bench, Cam Johnson's got 18, Campaign's got 10. Oops. A- Abdul Nader's got one, Frank Kaminsky's got one. Tory Craig, like you just said, is hurt, but he had eight. No one else. So, like, you could just say that they have, like, three bench guys. One of them is now hurt, so they really need someone to step up in a 2-3 role. You look at the Bucks. I mean, yeah, they, they have the same kind of thing with their starting five where everyone plays a ton, but they've Pat Connaughton getting 34 off the bench. Uh, Jeff I Teague, love, who's not, like, a, a, a bad basketball player. And Bobby Portis, I mean – like only getting five minutes, I don't know. Personally, like I think Bobby Portis is good enough to be on the floor and, and play. Now, I think like Aiton could push him around and baby him. That's probably why he doesn't play a ton. But I, I think Bobby Portis could help. Now, who am I? I'm, I have absolutely no basketball idea. But like he played for the Bulls. He was pretty decent. That's my extent of knowledge about Bobby Portis. So maybe get Bobby involved. So, but hold on. The, the one thing I also want to bring up, Jay Crowder, how many playoff runs has that guy been on? That guy's just a, a, a freaking winner. I mean, he was, was in, everywhere he, was he in the goes, finals for Miami last year. Yeah. He was on the Boston he was on the Boston Celtics Eastern Conference Finals runs with Isaiah Thomas. And then he was on the Cavs run with Braun that one year in 2018. I mean, he's been on a few. He still hasn't won the chip, but hey, that's a, that's the, the type of guy you want on like a oh, Suns dude. team. Where dude, dude. They, they like 10 they rebounds. Merge, yeah, they merge 10 like rebounds all youth, on defense. Merges all that defense. youth and that veteran and like just fills every gap that the Suns need. Yeah. He's, yeah, I, I think he's the most unsung hero of this team. No, I think Mikel Bridges is the unsung I think Mikel Bridges. He, seven points. Bro, he, puts, he can do it all. He's, he's an animal. I mean, it's not like I'm saying he isn't, but like Bridges is expected to get those buckets. Like I'm not – we're talking here like Jay Crowder got 10 rebounds. That's insane. I don't even do that on 2K. How tall is he? Like 6'8? I don't, I don't think Jay Crowder can jump more than 10 inches. The guy doesn't really do Crowder. a whole lot. He's just like on the floor. He's being six, a six. He's six, listed at 6'6. Six, six. Six, six. Yeah, he's probably 6'7 in shoes. Like the guy, he's got no business getting. Yeah, that but if you saw rebounds, a lot of the bro. rebounds he got, though, there were a lot of missed really, shots like, that kind of oh, fell into the corner and then he feed him the CP. Oh, he was just Mr. Hustle. All right. So we'll yeah. we'll chalk up half of those as like hustle rebounds. But yeah. in any case, like this, obviously, Phoenix is up 2 nothing. What I'm about to say is chalk. This is their series to lose. And it doesn't look like they're, I personally think they're going to lose. I think they'll lose maybe one game in Milwaukee just because it's like the finals. You maybe take one, give one on the road. In the Deer District. Yeah, in the you know, the Deer District. God forbid they get crazy there. I, I first that's that's another thing I got an issue with. All these all these teams and cities getting like cool nicknames yeah. for their Toronto. Yeah, Jurassic I, Park. Is that what it is? I was gonna ask because I thought every, that's what they call it. It might it probably is. I, everywhere's got one it, it, it's so trendy that i hate it now i don't i really don't want it to happen in chicago at any point i could definitely see it happening which is sad to say but i mean it's kind of like yeah, that. it's called jurassic park it's like that neck oh well that's no i got it i got a little gripe with that too that's a movie you can't just like take that well so here's my thing it's like with the raptors when they did it two years ago i thought it was sick i was like okay everybody thought the teams. raptors were sick two years ago that's a problem yeah. though like i know the, the international now it's like thought the was like the raptors well, the were is, sick dude, so my thing is like so like what's interesting is i saw this article too about the bucks about how this guy got a marketing job with the bucks right before they built their new arena and everybody said it was a shitty job because he, you know, the Bucks sucked. Like they had no nice stadium. It just was the middle of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Like who the hell wants to work for a team there? And now it's like the epicenter when you have Giannis who signed a super match to stay. They revamped the whole area with five serve. And they had that whole deer district area where it's like every kid our age that goes to Iowa is from Milwaukee hangs out there and goes out there now. And like, I've been trying to decide does the deer district, because to me on TV, it doesn't look that cool. But, like, is the Deer District only a place where I kind of want to go for a Bulls game next year? 
because of the fact that so many people in the Midwest like post stuff on their stories now? Or is this like a national thing? Like people are like the Deer District's a thing. You know what so I mean? I think because like the concept... Raptors thing, everybody was like, we want to go to Toronto for a Kawhi finals game. Like it looks sick. But like Deer District, like, is that something where you're like, hey, if I live in California, I want to fly for a no, game? No, no, I, I don't think so. I think you could just as easily see one of those pop up in LA and they'll call it like Lakerland or some stupid shit. And everyone will fly. Chicago there and look could at a never do that run. though. Uh, they'll call, they'll call the it uh, uh, the, the bull ring or some shit. I don't no, know. No, no, no. But how could the bulls do it outside the United Center? They'll just do it like down a street corner or whatever. They, they won't do it there. That's the thing. Like they'll find they'll ways. They'll do a guaranteed rate. Yeah, shit. They'll have it in the parking lot at guaranteed rate. Or when the Bears move out, they'll just keep that yeah, stadium and have Soldier everyone. Field. They'll have everyone go sit in there and watch every other sporting event <laughs> instead of being in that. Yeah. Like that's. I don't want to talk about Soldier Field. No, right so now. that's what I'm saying. It's like with like seeing the Raptors do it before, and some of these other teams can kind of do this type of thing. Like, I mean, the Lakers could because they have LA Live right downtown in LA. Like, how special is something like the Deer District? Like, how appealing is it really, or is it almost just like a, I don't get? Like, I think it, it's trendy. Is it only a factor? Crap. Is it only a factor of FOMO? Like, oh, it it's looks total cool, FOMO. but you go yeah. and it's not no. that cool. No, definitely. I'm I'm all on that. Uh, the one thing I will say about this whole like live viewing experience is the one the one that gets it right are like international countries when it comes to soccer matches yeah. because it's the whole city. Oh, it's the whole city, but like it's tradition. Yeah, you just think it's like something that's always happened there. It's like they've always had those huge jumbotrons, even way back when, and everyone would just sit there and like watch. <laughs> One thing that just kind of came in my mind was, you know how in like old time baseball when they would have those like boards and they would uh, update them with like lights to show the people where people were. Yeah. Do you think they ever did that for like soccer and how hard that was to like try and update oh, people sure. way back sure. when? That's well, impossible, dude. Well, I was thinking about, like, what is an American sports tradition that could replicate, like, the European stuff where they bleed it? You know what I mean? Like, we have diehard sports fans in America. Don't get me wrong. Like, people love their teams, but it's so commercialized. I have So here's mine. Here's mine before you give your answer. I feel like the closest thing can be game days in college towns. Yeah, mine was college football. Oh, yeah. That's the closest. It's just tailgating. Is that's it. Like people yeah. can bleed that like I think about Melrose like in the middle of football season. Like that's almost like a religious experience if you want to call it that. Yeah. Like there are just people who I mean think about the people who buy like $100,000 like RVs and just like drive these RVs, deck them out in Hawkeye stuff, camp here for a day or two and then literally just drive home yeah. and then they come back the next weekend. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Like just the dedication, like, I don't know. But so with the NBA finals, like what do you think the sun's biggest obstacle on their path to winning these final two games? And what's your serious production? Cause I do see Milwaukee winning it, winning one at home possibly, but it's just like last night when I saw Giannis put up 42, I'm just, and they still lose. What more could he do that really gets in the way of the Suns and the, the things that I thought of the only two people who I think need to step up for them to win a game are Middleton and holiday. I mean, Middleton went five for 16 from the field holiday went seven for 21. He put up 17, but still didn't produce going seven for 21 from the field. So, and he only went to the free throw line three times. Middleton didn't go to the line at all. And he made one three. So like for those guys, like if they stepped it up a little bit, I mean, I think they can take a game so I could see that happening at home. But, like, if they if the Suns, like, play, you know, if they lock down Giannis a little bit, maybe hold him to 30, and Milton and Holiday are performing the same way, I feel like this could be a Suns sweep. Yeah, it could be a Suns sweep. I, I think it'll – I want to see it in five, though. That's I do. I, I, I think it'll end up in five. I, I don't think there's anything that's going to hold the Sun back. Suns back other than just playing their game. And, I mean, Giannis is going to do Giannis. It's just a matter of – locking down Chris Middleton not letting that safety valve go hot and I mean you you can try and let Drew Holiday do his thing but I mean he's not as consistent I don't think he's going to be as big of a threat so personally I think the Suns will get it done in five I mean we say Suns in four because it's a cool trendy thing but yeah I think it'll go in five I think Milwaukee will take one with some good home momentum and 
I mean, it is what it is. It's it's the finals. I think so, they'll take one. So I have two business questions for you on contracts. Then one, did Giannis make a mistake signing the supermax in Milwaukee? Nah, he. I mean, he got to get his money. Whatever. I mean, he's. Like, gonna... Do you think he wins the finals there? Um, With the same dude. So let's just say the next year or two. Uh, I don't think he. Mm, I can't say that. All they think... Middleton. Could they beat Braun? Could they beat? I think if the they Clippers, get. Could it, they see, beat the, the problem Jazz? is like Giannis hasn't had like a legit big that can like kind mm-hmm. of be another down low mm-hmm. guy. I mean, Brooke Lopez plays good defense and Brooke shoots Lopez, the three ball. Yeah, he's he's I. Let's get someone a little he's more athletic. Good. Let's Lopez. get him more athletic. Brooke Lopez used to not play defense. Now he's a defender now. Yeah, he's a defender. He defense. It's okay. He's like, how old though? So I, I think Milwaukee, like they got a couple pieces. If you, I mean, if, if you keep Drew, Chris, Giannis, you're doing fine. I mean, if you just build around them, you're doing fine. You have a chance. So just a matter of like putting the right people in the right place. And so, they'll, be, they'll be there. I don't think you made the wrong decision. I mean, you got to get that money. I mean, Dame, 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 paid, Dame got paid in, in Portland. He ain't going to stay there. So, I mean, Giannis yeah. could just as easily find a way out. Yeah, I mean, when you look at the stat sheet from the game the other night or from last night, um, Pat Connaughton played 34 minutes. Pat is just an offensive guy. I love mm-hmm. Pat, but he can only play offense, no defense. Like, if you watch the game, CP3 book, they took advantage of those matchups. They would just blow by Pat. And they'd work around Pat. And so the thing with the Bucks too, I think, with their depth is he's a defensive liability. When Drew Holiday goes out, they have nobody to really pick up the slack. I mean, you, you have Teague, but Teague's just been, like, okay during the finals so far. I think he's been a let, let down. I thought Teague would be a much more valued player in this series by Bud with their history in Atlanta and the trust he has in Teague than he has been. Like, he only played 12 minutes last night. But – Talking about point guards, Chris Paul is going to get a payday. He's probably going to opt out of this deal, which is shocking because the Rockets owner, um, the Rockets owner literally said that when they, when he bought the team a year or two ago or two years ago, the Chris Paul contract's the worst contract in sports. And now Chris Paul isn't just going to make the final like 40 million on the deal. He's going to opt out of that 40 million, probably sign a three to four year max deal. Or close to a max. I think he'll sign around three years, 100 mil. That's kind of what I'm thinking. I think he takes a little less. But do you think the Suns, and this might sound crazy to say in the middle of a finals run, but should the Suns be locking a 36-year-old Chris Paul until he's close to 40? I mean, if he wins the finals, yes, and he's probably going to. But, but with the young talent they have, is it worth you ha- it? You have to because they don't have a point guard. So you have to if you're Phoenix. You literally have to. So if they don't, that means they they know that they have a sure shot option to go to if Chris Paul's not there. And quite frankly, being a Bulls fan, campaign was not someone I thought that could be a Chris Paul replacement. So uh, they got it. Campaign was trash on them. Yeah. And I mean, granted, campaign's not exactly the best basketball player ever, but he's, he looks like a role he's player right good. now. No, so he's I, I, got, I got no gripes with him, but I – I do think that they have to if they want to sustain this little window that they have. I mean, especially before Aiton gets, like, really paid. So, I mean, they're going to have to pay a lot of people soon. If you want to make Chris Paul a priority, I would right away after the year. Like, you got to give him what he wants. And, I mean, you got to make it reasonable because other mouths got to get fed. But, yeah, you really do got to do it. There's, There's really no other way around it. The thing I find interesting about Chris Paul is he's just a guy you can trust with the rock and make the right play, which that's hard to have with a point guard in general, whether it's high school, college, or NBA. But to have a guy who really pounds the rock, can score, make plays, with a guy like D. Book, who all he has to do is shoot. When I was watching the game, and then I'm ready to move on to our next topic, is when I was watching Chris Paul play, I wondered, I'm like, Chris Paul, 10 years ago, had the opportunity to play with Kobe Bryant. That got rejected by the NBA. Look at what he's doing with D-Book. When D when he's 36 years old, D-Book's 24. Imagine close to prime Kobe going towards the tail end of prime Kobe and a young Chris Paul. What yeah. that would have been. It's like, I mean, Derek Fisher's 
you, you think back to like when Derek Fisher was there and like, yeah, he yeah, won all five chips with Kobe. He, he was good. Don't get it twisted. Like Derek Fisher got it. It was a solid player, but you put in Chris Paul. And I mean that the margin of error for Kobe, I mean, it was slim at times, but it just opens wide up and Kobe, Kobe can be extra Kobe then. It's because really then cool I look idea. at it because then I look at it and I'm like, you don't do the Dwight Howard trade. Pau you Gasol you gets get traded Nash. to New Orleans. You don't do the Steve Nash thing. You build around Kobe and CP. So even if Kobe goes down two years later, three years later, whatever, you've got CP. Yeah. What does that look like? And then who are the young guys who end up putting around him? If the Jordan Clarkson's come in or whatever, what does that team look like? So it's just an interesting thought. But now going into something that we're predicting that's coming up soon is the home run derby. So we got Shohei Otani versus Juan Soto in the first round, the one and eight seed. We got Salvador Perez and Pete Alonzo, four or five seeds. Joey Gallo and Trevor Story as the two and seven seed, and Matt Olson and Trey Mancini at three and six. So who do you got winning between Shohei and Juan Soto? Well, that's like the thing. It's like that's the worst matchup Shohei could ever have, I think. Like Juan Soto could – easily rip off I, I here's the other thing i got a problem with i got a lot of problems but like the home run derby i can't even give like an accurate prediction of like how many home runs i think are gonna get hit because i don't know how much time there's gonna be they change it every year i don't get it so I, i'm not gonna give a home run amount. i don't know Juan Soto could hit a ton of home runs and so can Shohei. but that's probably the worst matchup Shohei could have ever thought for this magical year he's on um I think if you ran this in a simulation, Shohei wins like 80% of the time, but I think that'll happen. Juan, I mean, Juan's just going to pull the hell out of the ball, and mm -hmm. Shohei can put it anywhere. So I think that'll give Shohei a little edge, but then again, they are in mile high, so anything can fly. So, yeah. So th with that in mind, I have Shohei winning the first round versus Juan Soto. I mean, I'm just too into what he's doing. Like, I read a thing today that or yesterday that show hey this is from their batting coach um the angels batting coach he doesn't take bp this year he hasn't hit all bp and he's leading the league so then i'm just like okay yes he doesn't practice for something like this but then if he can hit 95 and then he's going into this like oh some guys tossing me balls and i never take bp i'm warmed up i'm not over hitting you know like trying to practice for this and it's all natural. I love the all natural approach. So I'm all in on that. So I have him winning that. Hold on, Between Sam. I'm going to stop you right there. The fact that you just said he doesn't take BP. I remember I heard that too. That scares me now. I don't think Shohei might win the first round because he hasn't faced a nice dead fastball down the middle every so often and just gripped a home run. He doesn't really feel that. See, he hasn't that's seen it. Thought. That's, that's scary. That's a that's scary thought now. But I'm just like, if you're Juan Soto, you're like, shit, this guy, like, yeah, it's, it's Shohei, but I'm one, I won a freaking World Series. What has Shohei done? That's what I'm saying if I'm Juan Soto. I proved He's becoming it. an absolute – even if this is his only amazing all-star MVP season – He's gonna be a legend forever with that's the way facts. he's playing. No, that's so facts. like, like he's getting ba he's getting compared as better than Babe Ruth, and like how many people get the Babe Ruth legend comparison? Like he's gonna be a legend. Like he's uh, living up to the hype that like a few, very few. But think about it, with Shohei, like people were calling him Babe Ruth before he came over. And everybody was like, he can't really do that with baseball. Everybody's like, if he could do that, that would be unbelievable. And then he comes over and we're like, holy shit, this yeah. guy's legit. Like, yeah, he's it was stunning. So yeah. I got him winning the first round. I have Pete Alonzo beating Perez. I just I don't agree. see Perez. Perez winning. is like in there just because they needed another yeah. name. He's yeah. too old to hang. I don't and think they gave him the four C just to like even Seniority. it out or something. Yeah. And then I have Joey Gallo beating Trevor Story because yes, it's Trevor Story's home park, but I just think like Joey why is Gallo, Trevor Story like that's another right. name where it's like yeah, Trevor that's Story can hit in. the ball, it's just thrown in. It's like I'm yeah. not I'm not sold on this. This like field will finish through like the next couple of predictions, but like I'm not sold on it as being like a, a great home run derby. It'll be good. It just I don't know if it'll be great. Right. And so then I have Trey Mancini beating Matt Olson. That's the yeah. upset I have. I think that would be fun. I think, yes, Matt Olson has hit 21 home runs, but 
He's also an Oakland A, not to hold his team against him, but he's Ooh. an Oakland A. Yeah, but I mean, that's, yeah, I mean. <laughs> but also, like, I look at it, like, I look at it, like, Trey Mancini, like, he has something to prove, like, Ori- nobody watches the Orioles, like, nobody cares about the Orioles. This is his one, like, real national spotlight the rest of the year. He's going to want to put on a show. So then Hold on. one, 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 one little stat I had about Matt Olson. Cause I'm a big Matt Olson guy. I like mm. him. One stat I had since he's been called up from the A's since it said August 8th, 2017, mm. only three players in baseball have gone deep more than he has Nelson Cruz, JD Martinez and Eugenio Suarez. So this he's asking to win this in a, a Coors field where it don't fucking matter how hard you hit the ball. It's probably going to go out. Like he, he's going to pull a home run every single time. Yeah. I don't know. I think this I, is, a, I, I, this is, I think this might sneakily be the best matchup. We'll see. I, I think it will be the most fun matchup. Yeah. But I have then Shohei versus Pete. I have Shohei blown Pete out of the water. Yeah. Um, I think Pete's going to lose gas after round one. I think then I've Joey Gallo versus Trey. I've Joey winning here. Dude, I love watching Joey hit. Like, I just love it. You know like, who Joey Gallo reminds me of? It's who? fucking Adam Dunn. He smokes the baseball. Yeah, but if he doesn't smoke it, dude, he's striking out or they're pitching around him because yep. he's 6'7". So, like, pick your poison. His strike zone's huge. It's You can't really, like, lay it over the plate because he's got a really good – Really good approach, guys. So that's the last why 10 I think games, he's, good he's hit for this. 10 home runs. Yeah, dude, he's because I don't remember, he's just he won. reserved for the hit for the home runs. And then if he misses, he's like, Who cares? I strike out all the time, like, bro. He I'm won, I'm off. pretty sure, some like minor league, like MLB futures home run derby. Like, I Joey Gallo well, has been. Did you see born his videos this. during quarantine when he was yes. like hitting baseballs in his he's apartment? Born, and stuff? He's born for yeah. this. So I have in the finals Shohei versus Joey. I have Shohei. I'm just gonna be like, because Shohei doesn't care about the spotlight of this. He's just oh, this is like, his. I'm, this is his year. Gonna, yeah, it's just like it's storybook. Like he dominates in this. He, let's just hope he hits like 50 home runs in the season or something yeah. or close to it. And then it's like okay, like and he throws like a 207 ERA. Like this guy, like he does it all. So I just want to see him win it. Part of this is bias, but also I think he's just better than Joey. So. So a couple names that I wish were in this, but obviously you can't sit there and force him to do it. Schwarber, Schwarbs, he's hurt. Vlad. Uh, Vladdy, you'd want Tatis instead of Story, but obviously you have the story of, like, it's in Colorado. You should probably have a Colorado player. Um, honestly, if Aloy was healthy, he would probably do it just because Aloy's that type of guy. But he's uh, not healthy. No, he's not. I, I like watching – I do like watching whenever Jock Peterson's in it because he's a pure home run yeah. derby hitter. Yeah. Um, other than that – he's And the thing with Jock is Jock isn't a dude where when he's in the home run derby, you're like, why is this guy in it when he's done no, nothing he's in the regular season? Born Everybody was like, derby. oh, yeah, Jock's in it. This that was how I found bro. out who Jock was. Was like he, he sucked his first year in L.A., but he, like, hopped in the derby. And I nearly, like, if he didn't win it, he nearly won it. It was insane. Um, another name is Acuna. I mean, he just doesn't want to. That's fine. So uh, one one interesting thing I wanted to discuss before we move on is with a lot of people asking for like ro- robot umpires, there's been a lot of discussion of like how the catcher position is going to change and how there's going to be less of an emphasis on like the defensive qualities of a catcher because a like stealing's already down teams don't run as much they worry about hitting them in with a home run but b so you, you don't need to like worry yeah. about like 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 where you're framing it you just need to catch the ball make sure you don't drop it my my question is like you never really see a catcher in the home run derby mm-hmm. a lot of that is because sometimes the best hitters don't play catcher you want to save them for first let their bodies be healthy let them hit in the next like 10 years or so, when they actually do go to like this robot umpire, maybe 20, I don't know when they're going to do it. Like, I wonder how many more catchers are going to be in the home run derby and how much better catcher hitting will be because catchers, like you never see them like top of any offensive category, but they're, it, they just can't like, they physically are playing the most demanding position on the field once you take that like defensive liability or like focus out 
I think we're going to see a ton more catchers. Like I think if Schwarber came up 10 years in the future, he could still be a catcher, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. That's interesting. Well, I talked to a catcher the other day about what's more important. Is it more important to have the arm defensively or to be able to really catch the ball and force a strikeout and kind of mess with the umpire's sight of the strike zone? And what I was told was basically you can have a great arm. That's wonderful. But with people not stealing as much and stuff, it really doesn't matter. It's more for show, you know, to be a gunslinger like that. I mean, when people watch it, it's unbelievable. But if it's not happening that much, it's not that valuable compared to being able to move the glove and the line of vision and, you know, not looking like you're sweeping from up, but moving down and up. And so one thing I do wonder is with the home run derby, if a catcher doesn't really have to work on some of these extra technical skills, do they become more jacked? Do they not worry about? Yes. Oh, I a hundred percent think so. I think like you look at, do they not have to worry about pliability as much? Yeah. Because like, they don't have the, to... pr- the prototype I think of like a catcher and this is just like being in our generation is Yadier Molina. And like, you look at mm-hmm. him, he's, he's six foot two fifteen. The guy's not too tall. He's not too thick. He's like, he's got everything. He's just compact he keeps the ball in front of him. He's not too big. So he can't go down and like split squat, whatever. Like he does everything he needs to do. And he's had great durability. Like that's been something that like is necessary for all catchers is like, you, you Joe can't has been in the home run derby. I'm looking at catchers. That's interesting I that I never thought about that. But then like you, you think about like, was that when Joe Maurer was a catcher or first baseman? I'm curious. Because I 2008, so so that was catcher, catcher. Joe Maurer. So that's that's really imp- that's time. really impressive. But I think there will be like, uh, not like there's going to be like six six catchers, but I think you'll you'll see a, a wider variety of like builds. And one one guy that comes to mind for the Sox, like Tyler Flowers, he was a big oaf behind the plate. He's like six six two forty, and you never you, you never like thought he could stop a pitch and sometimes he could but he just didn't like he just wasn't that and I think going forward we will see better athletes behind the plate but I don't know it was just like a, an interesting theory I, I was milling around in my head because you never really see teams give like big contracts to catchers, catchers and when the Sox yeah. paid Grandall that four year 72 I think it was like whoa and like Grandall's Gary a good catcher Sanchez. Yeah, yeah. I mean, was, Gary, uh, he didn't do that great in it, but like Gary's got the ability to hit a home run. So I mean, he made it to the second round. Yeah, I. And he lost by one home run. Again, point being, you don't see it every. It's it's like a shooting star. So I, I think that's something that we could look forward to in the future. Some catchers, but I don't know. It was interesting. I was like, just yeah. jumping down a rabbit hole in my brain of like how this is like just gonna change baseball, and I don't know. It was interesting to me. Yeah, what, are we, what are we talking about next? So speaking of baseball and Chicago sports, ESPN dropped an article written by Jesse Rogers that basically Jed told everybody we're sellers. In the last 11 games, it changed everything. Yep. So basically, let me give Cubs fans who haven't followed the team that closely a little backstory. 11 games ago, we were first place in our division. We're like, let's get rolling. Who needs you, Darvish? We this is a steal. We got Zach Davies. We're chilling. We're cooling. KB is gonna get re-signed. We're we're running this thing back. Like we're gonna go on a tear. Like this is what all Cubs fans are thinking. We are hype. Like we are like, we got through May. We are not gonna. This fall. is 26, 2016 all over again, right? We are not. That we was the not, vibe. No, hundred no, percent. No, no, it was. We were gonna retool so next year we could be twenty sixteen. But this was like, let's get to the NLCS at least. That was kind of the mentality. So what happens is we're first place in the division. Things are cool. And like, you know, Jake Arrieta is healthy. He's on the IL now. I mean, you know, just I'm saying the little things, you know, people getting hurt. But in 11 games, we go from first to like nine games back, eight games back maybe now that we won today against the Cardinals, which is always, which is always nice. But we go – and Jack's just grinning right now. Like, I love seeing the Cubs lose, and I love this happen. I mean, it's good. So, it's good that you, everyone's finally, like, smelling the coffee and realizing, like, 
you can't, you can't, this isn't sustainable what we had going. We traded away the pitcher so, that would give us wins. <laughs> it can't happen. So, so 11 games ago, we were buyers where everybody was calling us saying, hey, we'll sell to you. We want to help you. That's what Jed said was everybody was calling to sell to us. Now, everybody's hitting us up. KB's looking really nice. Oh, Javi. Oh, he strikes out a bit, but you know what? We'll take him. Oh, Craig. Oh, Craig. Craig being an all-star. We could use him for a World Series run. So now everything's kind of slowly crumbling off of the Cubs dynasty. And so now what I want to know, Jack, is who do you think we sell? How many guys do we sell? And how bad do the deals look and what we get in return? So I think if you trade Javi, this is the first thing. If you trade Javi, that's going to be the most questionable return ever. He needs a contract. He's the most. And most of these guys are going to be free agents. That's yeah, the other thing. I have to he's the most there. volatile of all of them because his bad is worse than the worst in the league. And his good is sometimes the best in the league. So you don't know what you're getting with Javi, you know, like. There was that incident earlier this year, and I get it. You put a microscope on it, but you forget how many outs there were on the base path at home, and you have the shittiest attitude and body language. Like, dude, I don't know, man. You're a pro baseball player. A lot of people look up to you. Let's, let's like, have a better attitude. I don't think Javi, like, has the greatest of attitudes, but, like, I'm not going to pick at some guy. I just think that's going to be a reason maybe the trade value for him would be lower. <laughs> I think the trade value for anyone, honestly, that would be highest is, I mean, Craig, just because, like, you know what you get. You think Craig over KB? I mean, the only thing I could think for, like, holding KB back is the same thing with Javi. It's like, you need a, he needs a contract. It's, are, are you really trading for a rental or do you want to, like, sign him long term? And if you do, this team's got to have a decent budget to make this happen because he wants his money. Um, so I think, like, who knows? Obviously, you gotta you gotta sell as high as you can on on KB, but with Craig, he's not expiring, right? I don't think he's an he's he on any more year left. Okay, so maybe I don't know. I I think it'll be KB and Craig, obviously being all stars, and if that's another thing I kind of want to talk about real quick is MLB All Stars. I, I disregard those now in my brain mm-hmm. because they're mid season awards, but for the trade deadline, that's the type of thing that helps a team especially pump value. So it helps having KB and Craig beating those guys in the NL, especially with the Cubs not being great. You know, you have two sort of bright spots that you could uh, try and build on. So um, no, I I think those two, I think Rizzo will be there. I don't know. I I think it's going to be, it's going to be tough to really sell that the Cubs want like to play winning baseball, but whatever. I mean, they, they got to do what they got to do with this situation. My debate is if we trade KB, which I would hate to, it, it would just be the, that's the moment where I've always looked at KB as being the center of this, the center of the Cubs rise and the center of the fall, because if KB would have performed the last couple of years with his bat, like we needed him to, I don't think we're in this mess. To be honest, I think, you know, obviously there's Schwarbs and some of those guys too that didn't live up to everything we need them to be in the moment. But KB was that guy, like, when he won MVP and Rookie of the Year, he was dropping like 100 RBIs his first three years and hitting around 20 to 30 home runs, somewhere in that range. And I was like, this guy's going to do it every year. This is unreal. Like, he came in, like, remember, like, the year he won Rookie of the Year, he came close to 100 RBIs. And he didn't even play the full season. So, like, right. I was like, this guy's going to be Hall of Famer, Cubs lifer. That's all I saw after 2016 is I'm like, Cubs lifer, no way in hell. Then came the last two, three years where we were low and consistent. He picks it back up, and it's just kind of like, great. This is Scott Boris's best robbery move of all time because KB is going to have a stat-pumped year that's going to get him paid with, a, with an MVP World Series, all this other stuff on his resume. And wherever he signs, he could be average KB again. So then with that in mind, I'm like, I probably wouldn't want to re-sign him. But then when you see how he plays, I'm like, but if we pay him and he plays like this, what could this do? So hold on, I have a question about a a, a scenario where they could have maybe been able to pay KB. And I said this to one of my buddies the other day. 
let's let's go back in time the last off season you don't oh, sign Jake time. Erie at a yeah 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 you don't you don't sign Jake Erie at a meaning you don't trade you Darvish meaning you also don't let Kyle go you re you, you sign Kyle for whatever he signed in in Washington because it's essentially what Jack Peterson's being paid you keep you you kind of keep what you had okay you get to this point in the year let's say the Cubs are five games back six games back let's say the mentality is still sell because the 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 thought was not that like that we were going to win win my question is we know what Schwarber is he's a great slugger he's a great righty hitter any AL team would probably want him for a team that's not you know contending and I said the other day if Washington wasn't contending, Schwarber would be getting dealt, no doubt. But, like, if you're Chicago, the Cubs, and you have Darvish, Schwarber, and someone else to trade, rather than needing to trade, like, a KB, a Javi, like, maybe you still make that decision between one or the other, and, you, of course, you trade Craig, but you don't, like, have to force yourself into trading everyone, and you still find a way to get prospects back, like, I felt like that you Darvish trade was made in such a knee jerk reaction way that kind of accelerated this rebuild into the, yeah, this crisis no, that it is right now. And it's like, if you held on to you till now, and obviously this is a lot of hindsight thinking, but if you hold on to him now and you get a team like, let, let's say the blue Jays, I don't know. I'm just throwing a team out there, but the blue Jays and they really want like a, a dominant number one to go alongside that Hyunju, whatever his name is, and they want to give you someone good, like the Cubs are in a great position to sell to any contender that has good, good prospects with you, Darvish, who like a top five pitcher right now in baseball, he can get you a win any day. I just think like they're in such a bad situation and like, yeah, it's really, it's low hanging fruit to make fun of, but you almost got it. I feel bad at, at a point because it was in my eyes avoidable because I think wrong decisions were made in like any sport, business like yeah it's the mistakes are made but i don't think trading you and letting schwarber walk in exchange for like jock and arietta is really the best case that could have happened for the cubs going from last year to this year like yeah they made the playoffs last year after like how many years was you here in chicago two three like dude that's not not even three i think call it two yeah call it two that's i don't i don't know i don't think like getting him and then trading away for, I'd say, a couple dimes on the dollar. Like, it's not worth it. And it kind of hurt them. Well, and it's like, now they got to, like, they're hoping that they can get something for KB. But, like, we've been saying just at the beginning of this segment, like, he's a rental. And that hurts right. his he's value, man. Like, I fear he's a rental. Then he goes to, like, L.A. and just makes L.A. I think better. he goes you to know. the freaking Padres. It's just or scary. the Padres, yeah. No, and he played in San Diego, yeah. too. But my whole thing with KB is like everybody was talking about the Mets, and I'm just like, yeah, I could see them if he goes to the Mets, like what do we get for him? Like in all reality, you'll get pitching. You won't get any position players, but you'll right. definitely get some. But pitching. when's the, where's the pitching valuable if we don't have any dudes who can hit? No, right, and that's <laughs> like, yeah. Then you still can't contend because then that's like the situation the Mets were in a couple of years ago when they had these great pitchers and they had hitters who could do nothing. Yeah. Yeah, that was like the I, I remember that's one of those like sports things you like to talk about where the, the Mets had Matt Harvey, Noah Syndergaard, Zach Wheeler, Jacob deGrom. Oh. They were all pumping heat. And it was just like unhittable, untouchable. And if they had have off- it's just like with yeah, football. Like, they where the, absolutely like the Bears. Nothing. The Bears yeah. defense produces and our offense yeah. does nothing. We we still lose the game. Like Yeah. And baseball you know is a sport where you need like the offense to score. It's not like the defense the can balance. do that for yeah. you. Yeah. So yeah, I, I think I don't know. It's gonna be I think July just for what's Cubs fans. Up is I feel like we're selling KB for pennies on the dollar. I, I agree. And I think for Cubs fans right now, it, it, the only thing that can make you guys feel any better is like you got to flush the pass and just say, fuck, like this is going to be a new exciting time. And it's, it sucks, dude. You got to wait two years. Well, and, to, and to be honest, to be honest, I don't even want to sell Kate. You know, it's such a stupid business decision to say, because usually you say, if you're not paying a guy, just get what you can get for him. But I don't want to sell him for pennies on the dollar. We get prospects that never make the team that we trade to like the blue Jays for their minor league system two yeah. years down the road. 
then it's like, great. We could have ended with KB, give him a farewell, whatever, send off, hey, go get paid. Thanks for the chip. Thanks for winning us an MVP. I always thought KB and, would be the one to get the extension instead of Javi, personally. I always thought that KB would get one right away. Just because of that, like, the well, start of his career was, like, like uh, it's such a crazy start. And he, like, he was there for everything in the perfect timing. Like, his start was eerily almost better than like how Rizzo started and how like KB just like, Oh, it was better. Like, I mean, he's a homegrown yeah, guy. That's what I'm saying. Like, and it's the embarrassing that he's going to leave. I thought what would happen if anything was the Cubs would commit so much money to pitching to their core. Cause they pay for pitching like overpay for pitching, but it would be good pitching that we would be a little cash strapped where, you know, this is pre pandemic thinking like, that we just couldn't afford KB's price range because he has Scott Boris as his agent. Because I saw what happened with Harper. I saw what happened with Machado and some of these other guys that weren't even on teams as good as the Cubs. Oh, do you hear that thunder? Dang. Oh, there, there's some thunder. I got to check this radar. Crackling in Iowa City. But you look at what happened, and it's just kind of like, KB is going to get paid, but like, it's not even going to be a thing where KB is getting paid three. You know, I always thought it'd be KB wants $300 million and the Cubs won't pay him the 300 million. And now it's going to be like, he still gets a nice payday. And yeah, dude, I was looking at the weather. Cause one of my friends is in town and he's like, Oh, it's not going to rain. Like, you know, like it's not going to rain. I'm like, it's going to rain. It's a good Midwest storm. Yeah. So my whole thing is just, I, you know, it's just not it's tough. Way Look, I'll, it's so I'll wrap tough it up for you because it's really tough to talk about. But it's like, dude, seriously, it, 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 it almost at, at this point, like, I do love to rag on Cubs fans, but 2016 was an unbelievable year for baseball, and there were so many, like, so Got many baseball fans back aspirations, just like the Sosa home run chase. You know, so many, so many aspirations for what it could have been, and. It's just, it's, I'll be it's honest. falling short, man. And it I would stinks, feel way bitter. I would feel way bitter about this, way more bitter about this, if we didn't win 2016, where it would oh, have yeah. been like we made it three straight NLCS, never even made it to a series or lost in the World Series in the game seven. It would have been even tougher of what could have been. This is more, I'm like, hey, we're the Chicago Cubs and we're complaining about not winning three chips and we're the Cubs. So I'm like, for us to get the one. I'm yeah, gr- and yeah, hey. this is for me. I'm yeah. somebody who's greedy as hell when it comes to winning. Like if the like the Blackhawks when we were on our tear and everything, I was you know more, more, more. Cubs, I've learned after all these years, 16 is plenty because I can still watch highlights yeah. and just get close to tears. Hey, you were alive tears. for it, and that's the thing that matters for a lot of things like that. It's like you you experienced it. They can't take that from you. And I never it. sat down. I didn't sit down the entire World Series. It's, I it's stood be, and yeah. like bent over. Like I was like ca- like in a catcher's position each pitch, and then I'd like stand <laughs> up, take a break, go back. I was like so on edge. Well, honestly. Saying on edge is a perfect transition because yeah, a lot of Blackhawk fans were on edge this entire last season with uh, Jonathan Taser, captain, just not playing, taking an indefinite leave. So we, tough. He came out recently on his uh, his Twitter, posted a, a video talking about what he was battling and kind of how he just needed to take a break. It, I, I'm going to botch this. I, I should look it up, but it was – immune system disorder it was something where his body's immune system would like it, it was almost like overreacting and not allowing him to properly like recover and be and it was like super drained yeah, and, to be him yeah. yeah he was drained all the time so eventually it just took look i gotta take a year and the thing that he really stressed was he didn't really want to talk publicly about it was he had covid and he also had this going on and he didn't want people to freak out and put two together, make an insane narrative. So he kept everything under wraps, kept it in house. And it really as well kind of stresses the fact that any speculation about like any of those athletes injuries that nobody knows about, it, nobody really will ever know about it unless they say, or the team has that explicit right to say, and it's speculation was insane of what Taves had and, People were like, we may never see him play again. I was thinking that just because of what a lot of people were saying. So mm-hmm. it's it's really good news for the team. I mean, the team, we'll get into the other news, but for a team that has been 
begging for a little hope with well, Duncan, and Duncan, what, Duncan Keith trade rumors and all that. You just to hear that Taze is coming back. That's that's good. That's good for the good for the organization. I mean, what's sad about when you look at this team though, because it's still young, is like the vets are Taze and Kane, which is so weird because they were always the young studs. Yep. And now it's like, how do we max out the little bit of prime that can be left or the little bit of the yeah. final years that they have? And the thing I just wonder is like, is it going to be wasted away on just mediocrity? Or can we go one? Like, I was so hype about when we competed in the bubble because I was like, we have these young guys, they experience playoff hockey. So I was hoping that was going to transition into this year, just like keep moving forward, almost like a quick rebuild, very quick, like a very quick rebuild, theoretically, in terms of, you know, we won the cup in 15. And then they're in 2020, like five years later, already back in the playoffs, right. really kind of, you know, barely in there, but competing. Um, I just wonder with him coming back, is it going to help us move forward or is it going to be, we can't let go of these guys because there are franchise guys and it's going to hold us back. I, I think I they'll, wonder. I think they will be lifers until either of them say I'm out. And that's because they have no trade clauses and their deals are both up. Well, and yeah. I think three years, I, you got three, what I'm saying you got like, three years to max it. Do you think we'll be able to maximize their talent and maximize the window? Well, given what we've seen so far, no. So that's my answer. I don't think we will. Um, I, I think the front office has proven to be inadequate at times with getting, you know, like a proper compensation for a player like Artemi Panarin. It's like Artemi Panarin essentially turned into Nikita Zadorov, who's a defenseman that the Hawks will not re-sign this year. I say that because they traded Panarin for Saad straight up. Saad was traded for Zadorov straight up. You traded Panarin for a one and done defenseman that will never probably play for the Hawks again. That's fucking asinine. Like that can't happen. Moves like that have hindered the organization moves in the past where they have traded first or seconds or something to move up at a deadline and get that guy that got us the cup. Nobody batted an eye at those. Those are being felt now. And any move that screws them up right now really puts them back. Their margin of error for the Hawks is slim. They don't have any room to screw up. They've been blessed with a decent young goaltender in Lincoln, and he's all right. Um, but their biggest problem has just been keeping the puck out of their own net. That's been the big issue. They can't figure out the defense core. I mean, they have some guys, but, you know, it scares me if they trade away Keith. You, you, Murphy is not a number one. There's been rumors of them moving around, trading for someone. They got to make a big move if they want to really keep this window open. They got to get a number one defenseman. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I – you could just kiss any relevancy goodbye. And I think the Hawks games, like seriously, I, I don't think they'll sell out this coming season. Um, and part of that is because of kind of like what I wanted to go into as well. So like, this is, I would say like one of the, I'd say more uncomfortable things we've had to bring up on the podcast, but again, like news is news. It's you have to talk about it. And I, I want to, so um, there's a lawsuit that's been brought to the Blackhawks attention that a former video coach of theirs, Brad Aldrich was allegedly, he's been accused of sexually assaulting a former player of the Blackhawks. And then five years later doing the same at a Michigan high school and later, later serving months in prison. And he's now registered as a sex offender in Michigan um, and the lawsuit goes into detail on how multiple people within the front office uh, were aware of these allegations and just of the uh, incidents and there wasn't any action taken, no call to the local police department, law enforcement, nothing. It was handled in-house and from what I personally heard on a 670 to score interview with the lawyer who's representing the two um, plaintiffs john doe one and john doe two is plaintiff the right term did i get that right yeah yeah <laughs> i think she did buzzing uh what she said was the team the blackhawks essentially told the player uh one of their emotional i don't know mental skills coach uh was talking to the player and just said like in some way like it was the player's fault that this encounter and incident happened and it, it's just the way that the Hawks are handling this now publicly, they haven't, I don't think, put out any public statement regarding it. Um, but from every 
thing that I've been indicated if, from like Stan Bowman, John McDonough to uh, Paul Vincent, who has come out and said that he was aware of this meeting taking place to possibly even Joel Quenville. A lot of people knew about this apparently. And um, it, it's a big, big moment for the league. And I think the Hawks as well to try and get something like this correct, where there's been a lot of times where players in the past have felt like their voice can't be heard on a certain mm-hmm. matter. And this is an opportunity where rather than fighting it with legalities and technicalities and saying the statute of limitations doesn't allow this to be tried. I mean, yeah, you, you can use that jargon all you want and it doesn't, it, it, the right thing doesn't happen then. And that's what everyone wants in the end is justice and the right thing to come forward and, and end up being the solution. But yeah, it, it's a tough situation right now for the Blackhawks with this lawsuit. Um, there's, I don't know like when it's supposed to like start. I'm sure they got to get a lot of witnesses and people who are going to come forward and speak. I've, the lawyer also said on that 670 the score interview that multiple nearly a dozen former NHL players have said that they would come forward and speak out and, and speak to the like John Doe's defense and that. Um, yeah, it's just not, not something that, you know, with the Hawks, like we were just saying, tough situation for the organization right now, trying to keep this little window open. And when you hear that the front office that a lot of people are criticizing for kind of shutting this window you know, being a, a part of these allegations, it turns the, it turns the gas, the, the fire up a little mm-hmm. higher. And it's, it's really tough. A lot of people in this city are upset about it right now. A lot of people want heads to roll. I, I don't, I also don't know if the findings of this are going to be released publicly. The commissioner of the NHL did say, Gary Bettman said that once they review the findings of this independent investigation that the Hawks are conducting, and then there's obviously this lawsuit, but once the independent investigation findings um, are given to the league, uh, Gary Benton will figure out if they should be released or not. So that kind of p- takes me off too, where it's like, it, it's kind of like the public's right to know. I mean, we're the ones giving the money, investing in the team, you know, keeping them relevant and one like stuff like that isn't released to the public when people care so it, it it's a really shitty situation right now man it, it, it couldn't be any worse but yeah. th- there was one reporter that said it and I'll, I'll finish my little rant perfectly he said it's it's okay to be pissed at the blackhawks and it's okay to be stupid stoked that taves is coming back and it's completely fine to be feeling those things at the exact same time like that is yeah. within your human right. You can feel those things. You don't have to be picking one or the other. Yeah, no, well said. And um, we'll keep th- that story updated on the pod too as we go on and as we hear more for sure. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's a sad situation. The, um, the second uh, John Doe 2 was a a minor in a Michigan high school. And apparently the Blackhawks wrote a letter of recommendation for Brad Aldrich for this position. So it, it, it's really sticky. It's not something we like to talk about. It's, you know, it's something that we feel should be talked about. I don't personally feel like it's as covered as it could be here locally, but when there's no news about it, like there's really nothing to cover, but yeah, the organization's really been quiet on this and it's not, you know, it's not a, not a good situation. Like Sam said, we will keep you guys in the loop about it, but um, Sam, do you, do you have anything else to add on this? I mean, I don't really know if there is. Yeah. No, I mean, there's nothing else I can say except I agree with everything you've said and you summed it up really well. So I don't really want to step on that. Yeah. I mean, I, I appreciate that. It's, I, it's something that, I would say I, I'm passionate about just when sports organizations do the right thing, because there's a lot of people mm-hmm. in a lot of cities, a lot of kids that look up to these organizations and the players in them. And just any, any negative thing is just, it's not good, man. It's just not, not anything you want surrounding your team, especially something like this. And I think it's a big moment for the NHL where, you know, they can grow. So um, yeah, that's, that's all I have for it. 
Um, it's the end of this episode, but like Sam started this episode with, be sure to go check out Apex Brand on Instagram. Like you said, it's A P E X Brand underscore on Instagram. You're going to have that launch coming out shortly and a lot more content coming your way. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, Like always, not the same time, same place. We will see you guys later.